Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to take a few minutes and allow people to um, dial in. Folks, we're just going to give it a couple minutes to give um, our friends and neighbors a chance to dial in and then we'll get started. So just sit tight for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Good evening, um, and welcome to the 776 Summer Street Deconstruction Informational Meeting. My name is April Anderson, and I will be your moderator for this evening. On behalf of HRP and Redgate, thank you very much for joining us. We're excited to have you here with us tonight to share our deconstruction updates and schedule and to get your questions answered. We have up to two hours allotted for this meeting, and we expect our presentation will take about one hour. The second half of the session will be dedicated to community Q&A. If you joined us for our prior deconstruction informational meetings, we will follow the same process we followed in the past. Tonight, we are using the webinar format for this evening's presentation, just as we did in the fall. This means that the only people you will see on your screen are the presenters and your elected officials. 
We are expecting a high volume of participants in the session, and we want to make sure everybody has enough time to get their questions answered during the live session. So while you won't see yourself on the screen, we really encourage you to participate. We've tried to make it as easy as possible to submit a question. Just click the Q&A function that you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and that will open a text box. And there you will be able to type in your questions that will go directly to the panelists. If you are joining us by phone, you can send your questions via email to hrpinfonortheast at hilcoglobal.com. And you can see that address right on the screen. We'll do our best to monitor that email throughout the meeting and answer those questions live as well. You can feel free to submit questions at any time. So don't feel as though you need to wait until the presentation is over and the Q&A begins. We'll answer the questions in the sequence that they are submitted. And as I said previously, we'll do our best to answer all of the questions live here tonight. But if there are any questions that we don't get to, we will answer them in writing on our website. There you will find a transcript of all the questions asked from our prior two sessions, as well as the questions that are asked here tonight, written out online with answers. And we will be posting everything on our website. We are recording tonight's session as well, and you will be able to find that as well online. Watch it later this evening or some other time. All of these materials will be available in the next couple of weeks. And the goal really is to provide a comprehensive update as we move through our deconstruction phase of our project to answer all of your questions and to provide transparency in our public engagement, not only tonight, but throughout the remainder of the project. So with that, I will turn it over to Melissa Schrock of HRP, who will kick off our presentation. Thanks, April, and thanks to everybody uh, for joining us tonight. My name is Melissa Schrock, and I'm the EVP of Mixed Use Development at Hilco Redevelopment Partners. I'm joined this evening by many of my colleagues, our partners at Redgate, our contractors and consultants, as well as the Community Independent Environmental Reviewer, all of whom we introduced to you at our first and second infor informational deconstruction meetings that we held last fall before deconstruction actually began. Since our last meeting in October, we received approval from DEP for the first phase of abatement work on site and a demolition permit from ISD. Deconstruction work officially began in December and no doubt some of you have noticed the progress of the work on site with construction gates being installed, the installation of a wheel wash at the truck entrance, protections along the waterfront, the cutting and capping of utilities in the streets around the site, and other make safe work uh, that has been performed over the last few months. Abatement is now active and ongoing, and in the next few months, you'll start to see the deconstruction of some of the larger structures on site. So we thought it was an appropriate moment to hold another informational meeting now in order to provide the community with an update on our progress and information on what you can expect to see over the next few months. HRP and Redgate are committed to transparent community communication so that the neighborhood knows what to expect and when to expect it throughout the process. There is a lot of information available on our deconstruction website, which is www.suffolk-lstreetstationboston.com. It was shown on the last slide. Uh, there you will find a three week look ahead schedule information on the mitigation measures that we'll be discussing this evening, such as the perimeter dust monitoring we're performing, information on upcoming career events and contact information for us, for Suffolk and for the Community Independent Environmental Reviewer. There is also a hotline for neighbors to call with any immediate concerns. And as April mentioned, we'll be posting this presentation, a recording of tonight's meeting and the Q&A document with written answers to all the questions we received tonight to the website in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you may be wondering why I keep using the word deconstruction to describe the demolition phase of the project. We call it deconstruction in order to communicate the careful approach that we'll be taking to abating and dismantling components of the facility. As we explained at our prior deconstruction meetings, there will be no dropping or felling or tipping of large elements at the site. Next slide, please. Tonight, we'll introduce you to key ownership team members, meaning our contractors and the owner's abatement oversight team, as well as to the community environmental reviewer, GZA. We will then review the deconstruction means and methods, our overall schedule and sequence plan, truck routes under the, our construction management plan, 
how and when you can expect to see sidewalk closures around the site, and we'll review our mitigation measures, explain the abatement oversight procedures that are in place, provide updates on our ongoing community communications, including our workforce development activities and job opportunities at the site, and we'll touch on our upcoming filing for the first phase of redevelopment, which is scheduled to begin next year. So we're already on the team slide. First, I'll just say a brief word about us. L Street will actually be the fourth coal-fired power plant HRP has demolished. We've also demolished other complicated sites like the former Bethlehem Steel Mill on 3,100 acres outside of Baltimore, and we're actively decommissioning and demolishing a 1,300-acre oil refinery inside the city limits of the city of Philadelphia. Part of what makes us unique in the commercial real estate industry is our expertise with these kinds of former industrial sites. Our number one focus as we undertake the deconstruction work at 776 Summer, like in all our projects, is protecting human health and safety and protecting the environment. Safety is our top priority, and you'll hear a lot about that tonight and some of the belts and suspenders approaches that we take to ensuring it. Now, I wanna introduce you to the rest of the team. Suffolk, our general contractor, probably needs little to no introduction as they're one of the regions and in fact, the nation's preeminent general contractors. We've engaged them for the deconstruction phase to manage all subcontractors. They have responsibility for overall site safety, including perimeter pedestrian safety, truck access, the sequencing of the project and the overall project schedule. Um, in terms of the deconstruction scope of work, North Star is performing all of the abatement and deconstruction work. North Star is a national firm headquartered in New York State with a local office right here in Everett, Massachusetts, which was established in 1988. They have local and national experience specializing in complicated and contaminated sites, such as power plants, including the Brayton Point power plant in Somerset, Mass., and the Vermont nuclear power plant. They also have experience working in tight urban areas and next to residential neighborhoods, which require the utmost precaution. They're currently working at 1 P.O. Square and also a 30-story residential demolition project in Cambridge. They have about 150 local employees and are signatory to local unions 4 and 223. They'll go into more details on the means and methods, but to be clear, all structures will be abated before being dismantled, and again, North Star will not be using explosives or any methods that involve dropping, felling, or tipping large elements. Uh, as far as the owner's environmental consultants, we have TRC as our owner's consultant to oversee the abatement work being performed by North Star. TRC has an industrial hygienist inspector team on site and they're monitoring daily uh, they're doing daily air monitoring around the abatement containment areas. Once North Star has completed abatement in a particular area, TRC inspects it to confirm that abatement is complete and then DEP does a final inspection. Additionally, Sandboard Head is our owner's licensed site professional or LSP. They are performing perimeter dust monitoring, which is something that we have elected to perform here in order to uh, protect human health and safety. This is a belts and suspenders approach, uh, both for safety on site and for off site. Uh, and that's important to us. They produce monthly reports, which are posted to our website and will be discussed here tonight. Now I wanna turn it over to my colleague, Juliana Connolly, who will discuss the role of the Community Independent Environmental Reviewer, GZA. But before I do, just a reminder for folks and for anyone who may have joined a few minutes late, please don't hesitate to enter any questions you may have in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen as we're going through the presentation. We'll be answering questions at the end. Juliana? Thanks, Melissa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Juliana Connolly, and I'm the Executive Vice President for Environmental Remediation with HRP. During the entitlement process for this project, we committed to engaging an environmental consultant including a licensed site professional or LSRP, sorry, LSP, to review environmental reports and, and to answer questions from members of the community. This was an idea that came up as a suggestion during one of our earlier public meetings. And the intent was that the independent LSP would be separate from the LSP conducting work on behalf of ownership. LSPs, like myself, are responsible for ensuring that the cleanup of soil and groundwater is conducted appropriately and in accordance with Massachusetts regulations. 
specifically a regulation called the Massachusetts Contingency Plan or the MCP, you'll hear it referred to as well. To select an appropriate consultant for this role, we looked for a firm that had credentials in both abatement and deconstruction, as well as soil and groundwater remediation. We looked for a firm that had extensive experience locally in Boston and had experience working with government and local and community groups. We also were looking for a firm that was not doing environmental work for HRP on other sites so that they would be an independent reviewer of our work. After vetting multiple firms, we selected GZA. GZA's staff reviews our regulatory submittals, our plans that are submitted to regulatory agencies, reports, and other data that's prepared as part of the ongoing deconstruction work. They'll perform, perform an independent review of those documents and they'll be available to the community to answer any questions or interpret those reports that can be very technical in nature. Uh, GZA has and will, as you'll, you'll see tonight in a moment, um, participated in our past public meetings and they'll continue to participate in public meetings moving forward to answer any questions the community may have. Later, when we start excavating soils, GZA will also review environmental reports associated with those uh, soil documents as well. I'll now hand it over to Marianne Safanera and Rebecca Cox at GZA to introduce themselves so you can get an understanding of their background. Marianne? Thanks, Juliana. Um, my name is Marianne Safanera, and I am the Vice President of GZA. First, I'll tell you a little more about GZA, then my colleague Rebecca and I will each give a brief overview of our experience and education. As Juliana said, GZA is an environmental and geotechnical engineering firm founded in Massachusetts with over 50 years of experience in and around Boston. Our headquarters are in Norwood, and we have 30 offices, 17 of which are located right here at the United GZA employs over 700 people working in the fields of environmental science, engineering, water resources, construction management, and civil and geotechnical engineering. My background is an environmental engineer with a degree from MIT, and I'm a licensed and professional in the state of Massachusetts. I've over 22 years of experience, and my projects have ranged from environmental assessments to complex redevelopments. I've worked extensively in designing and implementing subsurface remedial strategies, as well as in above ground construction. Some of the services GZA provides that are relevant to the L Street redevelopment include um, environmental and um, like said, special services, site investigation, and remediation. But at this stage of the project, the documents we've reviewed thus far focus more on air quality, construction management, regulated materials, facility decommissioning, and asbestos monitoring. To date, there have been no instances observed in the air monitoring data set. Now I'll turn things over to Rebecca so she can introduce herself. Good evening, I'm Rebecca Cox. My personal background is that I'm a registered professional engineer and I've been with GZA for 19 years, currently as a senior project manager. My professional experience includes the design, management, and oversight of facility decommissioning and deconstruction projects. Particularly, my experience involves projects where asbestos abatement and management of regulated materials is required. I have served as the project manager and technical lead for numerous com complex abatement and decommissioning projects for major industrial and utility clients throughout the Northeast. Marianne and I are happy to provide support to the South Boston community throughout the L Street project. If you would like to contact us directly with any environmental questions, you can use the email address lstreet at gza.com. So far in the project, we've heard from a few South Boston residents and we've been able to assist them with getting answers to their questions. And next you will hear from David Pearson from North Star who will provide additional uh, background on North Star's project approach. Thank you, Rebecca, the project group, and most importantly, the community stakeholders for taking the time and allowing us the opportunity to share updates on North Star, our team's successes, to date at the site and our plan that allows us to continue on and safely abate and deconstruct the L Street Station. I am David Pearson, the president of North Star's Boston office, and I, along with our project team, have been doing abatement and deconstruction our entire careers. Our team for this project consists of Craig Pearson, 30 years with North Star, 
He is managing the abatement aspect of the project. Also with North Star on the screen is Jeremy Theroud, 20 years experience in industrial demolitions. Jeremy is the lead for deconstruction. For 33 years, we have been signatory with the laborers, in particular, Local 223 and Local 1421. And we are signatory with the operating engineers, Local 4. We remain in constant communication with these unions and have had good participation in attracting licensed and skilled workforce to date. Moving on to our project approach and confirming what Melissa stated, our work will not use explosives, not employ tipping or tripping of large elements. We have a 20 month schedule in which all structures will be fully abated prior to being carefully dismantled. Abatement will be performed in regulated containments. Next slide, please. The approach to abate the buildings requires that the workforce is licensed and trained. We currently have on site over 50 Massachusetts licensed and trained asbestos workers and another 10 North Star management from our project specific health and safety officer, project management, superintendents, and foremen. The buildings are systematically contained where doors, windows, vents, louvers, and penetrations are all sealed. HEPA filtered equipment is utilized to clean and filter the air. Decon chambers and waste loadout facilities are erected for each containment. Licensed and trained asbestos technicians, donning suits, respirators, and safety gear perform the activity of removing and packaging the asbestos. The packaged waste is then placed into transportation bins, which are lined, sealed, and hauled to their disposal site. Each work zone or containment is then inspected by TRC for completeness of work, ensuring visual cleanliness and air sampling to achieve air clearance criteria. This type of regimen will continue throughout all the buildings. And it's important to note that all of this work is done by a licensed contractor, North Star, with a third party consultant, TRC, and an independent environmental reviewer, GZA. In addition, the state and local inspectors have absolute authority to hold random inspections of the work. The Department of Environmental Protection has participated in seven inspections prior to work commencing and have approved the completeness of work in four of these. And only because the work is active in the other three areas has the DEP not performed post abatement inspections in all areas to date but we will coordinate with TRC and the DEP when these work areas are done. This belt and suspenders participation by the team and the governing agencies will continue throughout the entire project. As removal is completed, the building deconstruction will be happening. And I'd like to turn the project over to Chris from Suffolk for discussion on this. Thank you, David. Good evening, my name is Chris Hersey. I'm project executive with Suffolk Construction. Uh, the information I want to give a little background on here is also included on the website, www.suffolk-lstreetstationboston.com. Through the next two slides, I'll provide context for the deconstruction and abatement sequence and site setup of the ongoing deconstruction project. The image on the screen right now is existing conditions when the project started in December, 2021. For those of you at prior public meetings, we flipped the view on these images from the previous presentation to look south to better show the deconstruction taking place as you see through the, the slides further on. The project is bounded by East First Street to the south, Summer Street to the west, and the dedicated freight terminal, or the DFC as we call it, to the north. As we progress, you'll see the L Street Station deconstruction start from the north of the project, which is at the bottom of the page. At the bottom right of the image, there's a legend for the following slides. I'll walk you through this as background for the sequence. The dark gray pertains to buildings that are to remain. These are in the center of the project are, and are the turbine halls and the 1898 building. You'll see as abatement and deconstruction take place from the north to south, the purple areas are abatement, which are followed by the red, which are deconstruction. The project progresses in steps in this manner. On the next slide, 
for December 21 through March 2022, you'll see the site fence as yellow and the gates as green. This four months of the project is highlighted here. There's a yellow fence around the perimeter of the project and it will remain there throughout deconstruction. The green highlighted gate B, which we call gate B, is our main gate off of Summer Street. This is next to the admin building down in the bottom center of the screen. This is the main access to the project. You'll hear us talk about this a lot throughout the presentation. We'll speak also to truck routes further in the presentation. The location of gate B is specifically designed to keep traffic off of East First Street and the surrounding neighborhood. Staff parking for job site trailers, which is up in the upper left-hand side of the screen, will come off of East First Street, only for the staff. Areas of particular focus on the following sequence are the protection of Summer Street and East First Street. These locations will be scaffolded and scrimmed. The brick chimney on the main boiler house is one of the initial areas of the project deconstruction, which will have dedicated scaffolding and scrim around it as it is removed. This will be il illustrated in detail further along. With that preface, I'll hand off to Jeremy Thrud from Northstar to walk through the construction and deconstruction sequence. Thank you, Chris. I'm Jeremy Thord with Northstar Contracting. We would like to update you on the planned sequencing of the deconstruction efforts now taking place at the site that will continue through 2023. As you've heard, work will continue to be performed generally in a north to south manner across the site, with abatement being completed prior to the commencement of the deconstruction phase of each structure. As Chris stated, during this initial site preparation phase, the installation of all the site safety and security measures are currently in place. Additional installations will be added as new phases of work come online. Prior to starting each phase of work, the associated protection measures will be adjusted to ensure that public safety is paramount throughout the project. The team has disconnected and made safe all the appropriate utilities to the buildings under deconstruction. The site has been prepared and organized for the future work activities to occur. And all temporary construction elements that are necessary to create a safe work site have been installed for this current stage of work, as Chris described. Additionally, the structural engineers and our operations team have completed their analysis of the structure and finalized the deconstruction sequencing, some of which has already been in place. The team has elected to go through the process, progress through the overall deconstruction work in this north to south direction to reduce the duration of work visible to the adjacent neighborhood with concurrent work taking place on multiple buildings as access allows. This sequence of work includes leaving the facades along Summer Street and East First Street intact as long as possible to minimize the visibility of the work to the abutting neighborhood. To date, regulated materials abatement has been completed in various outbuildings and is ongoing in segments of the new turbine hall and the main boiler house on site. Additionally, the intake structures on the north end of the site have been deconstructed already. On to the next slide, we continue into the next phase of activities. Additional areas will be prepared by adding additional safety and protection measures prior to work commencing on each associated structure. Only after all the site preparation work is completed and all the safety measures are in place will the additional activities commence. For example, as Chris stated, the brick stack deconstruction, as shown on, in orange on this slide, will commence by first verifying that all environmental abatement has been completed, followed by a full height scaffold and installation, scaffold installation that will prepare it for the piece by piece dismantlement, lowering it section by section through the interior of the scaffold enclosure. Additionally, during this phase, regulated materials abatement continues at the site throughout this whole section of uh, the project, including the coal storage area, the main boiler house, transformer house, and the new Boston building. These are all highlighted in purple on this slide. So we'll have a lot of abatement work ongoing throughout this phase. Additionally, deconstruction activities will continue on the site during this phase, including deconstruction of portions of the new turbine hall and various outbuildings, but only after regulated materials abatement has been completed and cleared at each location. 
The next slide shows the same phase of work as I was just describing, but from a different angle. This is so you can see and visualize the site protection measures that will be in place during this stage. Chris will go into more detail on these later in the presentation. Moving forward to the next phase, is starting in July. Regulated materials abatement will continue. We'll continue at this site, moving primarily to the main boiler house, the switch house and the 1922 boiler house. Deconstruction efforts will continue to ramp up at the site as work continues at the new turbine hall. As you can see during this phase, a large crane will be mobilized to the site with work beginning in earnest on the extensive dismantlement effort at the new Boston building. Additionally, deconstruction work will begin on the north end of the main boiler building. During this phase, additional scaffolding and screening will be installed along Summer Street, as shown in orange on this slide. This will take place at the high boilers where piece by piece deconstruction of the structure will be taking place utilizing a cut and pick methodology. On to the next slide. We enter a new phase of work. Beginning in approximately October. During this time, regulated materials abatement will come to a completion at the site, which is a large milestone for the facility. This will allow deconstruction efforts to continue to expand, adding in work at the coal storage and the transformer buildings as it's depicted in red on the slide. The dismantlement efforts at the new Boston building will continue to be in full swing during this phase. The large lattice boom crane will be picking and lowering sections of the boiler superstructure to the ground, continuing from a north to south across the site. I want to take the moment to reiterate to what Melissa and David Pearson and others have stated throughout the presentation that this is a deconstruction effort. North Star will not be implementing any major felling, structure tripping, implosions, or explosives at the site. Moving forward, we progress to March 2023. You will note on this slide that we continue that we will continue to work on the main boiler house while deconstruction continues at the new Boston building with both work areas proceeding in a north to south manner. The team has elected to add additional layers of protection along the facade of the 1922 boiler house as it interfaces with East First Street. During this phase, a full height scaffold Two layers of decking and screening will be installed prior to the top-down deconstruction efforts taking place on this structure. This next slide again shows a different angle of the work for this phase to show the protection measures that will be in place both along Summer Street and East First Street during this phase, leaving the bus stop open at all times. The 1922 boiler house will be dismantled utilizing a floor by floor methodology. This will be accomplished by piecemealing sections down in a cut and pick manner to safely dismantle all structural elements. And all this material will continue to funnel through the interior of the site, eliminating all truck routing onto East First Street. After all the superstructure removal is complete, the below grade removal efforts will follow in each building area. Finally, moving on to the next slide. During this last phase of work, the site deconstruction efforts will be concluded. At this point, the team will do the final grading of the site. And as you can see, the historic buildings will have been fully preserved throughout the deconstruction process. And the site will be fully prepared for the future development efforts. With that, I'll turn it over to Chris with Suffolk to talk through truck routing, as well as additional construction mitigation measures that will continue to be in place for the duration of this project. Chris. Thanks, Jeremy. The, the next three slides are going to walk through the trucking routes, and then the traffic and sidewalk updates uh, between Summer Street and East First Street. We'll start here with the, the truck routes. Truck routes throughout the project will travel on Summer Street. This image illustrates the inbound and outbound trucking and the routes for the project as delineated with the red and blue lines. All trucks will enter and exit the project main gate, which was gate B from or to the north, which is Summer Street. Truck traffic will max out around 20 to 25 trucks per day at the peak of the project. Importantly, trucks are not routed down East First Street or into the adjacent neighborhood. To reiterate, all trucks will come or leave from the north. On the next slide, 
I'll walk you through what's happening on Summer Street and with the protections we're putting in place in the sidewalk. Between June of 2022 and June of 2023, around a 12 month duration on Summer Street, this is how we're going to set up the travel lanes. No travel lanes will be closed during construction on Summer Street. Pedestrians will be, will be rerouted to the west sidewalk, which is that dashed orange line. If you refer to the insert at the upper right, this shows scaffolding with a debris screen and it's erected on the sidewalk for public protection against the wall as a belts and suspenders approach to safety. Additionally, on top of that, we have Jersey barriers with fencing. They'll be installed to create a protective lane for traffic. Understanding that the number seven bus stop is a lifeline for the neighborhood, it will be kept open for the duration of this project. That's at the bottom right-hand corner of the image. If you could go to the next slide, I'll walk you through East First Street and the work taking place there for street sidewalks and parking lane closure. Similar to Summer Street work, no travel lanes will be closed during construction. Pedestrians will be rerouted to the south sidewalk, which is the orange dash line. Again, if you refer to the inset, where the sca there's scaffolding with a debris screen will be erected on the sidewalk for public protection against the wall. Similar to Summer Street, Jersey barriers with fencing will be installed to create a protective lane between the work zone and the traffic. East First Street sidewalk closure and Summer Street sidewalk closures will overlap at portions of the deconstruction of this project. Again, in this phase, you'll note that the existing number seven bus stop will be protected and maintained through the life of the project. I'd like to give you a couple examples of what the debris screen and protection looks like on the next slide. This slide illustrates examples of scaffolding and debris screen that are similar to what you'll see on Summer Street and East First Street as protection. We're highlighting these to help provide a visual of what will be seen on these walls during work. As shown in the previous slides, roadway travel lanes were protected with Jersey barriers and fencing in order to delineate traffic and provide a safe barrier between traffic and work zones. As work progresses, the scaffolding will be lowered in sections in tandem with the building deconstruction. On the next slide, I'll speak to uh, worker parking, which has been a highlight on a couple of the public meetings. At the request of public officials and local residents in previous meetings, the project has sourced local parking close to the site. You'll notice the, the red square at the bottom center of this image. Our goal is to minimize traffic impacts to the neighborhood and to coordinate and organize worker access to the job. 885 Summer Street has been dedicated to construction worker parking. We encourage workers to park in this sourced parking lot, which is proximal to the job site. Workers are also encouraged to take public transportation to the project as well. Parking at the job site is limited to field office personnel for the lifetime of the job. On the next slides, I'd like to talk through a couple of mitigative measures. We understand that the work performed on this project will not only affect the immediate site, but will also have the potential to affect the adjacent neighborhood. Therefore, we formulated a number of construction mitigation measures I will review over the next four slides. The first being rodent control. Rodent control was an area of discussion in the last public meetings, and we have implemented inspections and monitoring on a continuous basis for rodents. We spoke with our certified rodent control exterminator and have followed these recommendations. Firstly, the project site has been continuously monitored over the last six years under the ownership of HRP Redgate. A rodent control site survey has been performed by a licensed exterminator in order to reevaluate the current conditions on site and the potential issues that could come with it. Traps and bait stations have been installed in specific areas as defined by this survey. The licensed exterminator is installing bait traps in compliance with the city of Boston regulations. The ongoing project rodent control program includes 50 plus perimeter 
rodenticide stations, as well as comprehensive rodent trapping components at building perimeters and interiors. This licensed exterminator is currently performing weekly documented, documented site inspections and project management is performing daily monitoring of on-site rodent control. For the next slide, uh, I'll speak to noise control. Following our measures on the project to mitigate and monitor noise, work will be performed during City of Boston hours of 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. with Saturdays as necessary, requiring City of Boston permitting. Additionally, quiet work will take place during the second shift inside the building for abatement, safety, and in prep preparation for the next day shift. Noise levels are to be maintained within the City of Boston limits for construction. To track this, during the life of the project, noise monitors are set up to detect any exceedances of these allowable limits. Work is being coordinated and planned to minimize noise, and we are not expecting high impact or vibratory activities, as Jeremy Thurud from North Star has noted. On the next slide, we'll speak through the vibration monitoring. There are two parts to the vibration monitoring on this project. First, there will be continuous on-site vibration monitor. Instruments have been installed on site adjacent to ongoing work in order to provide continuous monitoring. Second, additional vibration monitoring locations have been installed in the neighborhood for <clears throat> off-site monitoring of Summer Street and East First Street. The intention of the vibration monitoring is to track and maintain levels within allowable thresholds. The fourth mitigative slide is dust mitigation. The project team has a particular focus on the mitigation and monitoring of dust. Water is utilized for dust control during the deconstruction phase of work. This includes such things as washing down equipment, wheel washes for equipment, misting during deconstruction activities, and the maintenance of stockpiles on the project site. To, to give you a little more context to the engineering controls to be utilized by Northstar, Jeremy Throod will give you a couple items here. Thanks, Chris. Throughout the project, we'll be utilizing various types of engineered mitigation controls to eliminate dust migration from the, from the site throughout <clears> the entirety <throat> of this project. Hello. Some of these controls include a wheel wash station. An example of this is shown at the top image on this slide. Heavy equipment will be plumbed with spray nozzles, will also be utilized along with direct spray, as well as water misting cannons, such as dust bosses. An example of this item is shown on the lower image of the slide. These will be utilized throughout the site, depending on the specific work activity taking place. The engineer controls will be adjusted throughout each work <coughs> and monitored as conditions change. Hull roads and stockpiles will be monitored multiple times during each shift to eliminate offsite dust migration. Additionally, Northstar will continue to closely monitor our mitigation efforts throughout each shift, utilizing visual inspections and a daily log of all work activities to verify the conditions encountered at the site and the successful implementation of engineering controls for dust mitigation that were employed throughout each shift. Now I'll turn it over to Juliana Connolly with HRP to discuss the perimeter air monitoring aspects of this project. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, as we've mentioned earlier, we've been monitoring dust concentrations at the perimeter of the property to ensure that the dust mitigations, that dust mitigation measures that Jeremy just spoke about are effectively doing their job. That, that's the purpose of the monitoring, to make sure that we don't have um, elevated dust concentrations at the perimeter. The consultant that's doing this work for us is Stanmore Head Associates. This is the same environmental consulting firm that is our licensed site professional for the project. There are six dust monitors that Stanmore Head has installed at the perimeter of the property. So there's two on um, each of the sort of street facing sides of the property and then one on the other two sides of the property. Dust monitoring began in January, and all dust concentrations that have been measured since beginning in January have been below action levels. 
The dust monitoring occurs continuously and the data is reported in real time to a website that Sanborn Head monitors. The data also has the ability, or the website also has the ability to provide real time notifications if dust concentrations are observed to increase and approach, approach action levels. That's a really helpful uh, tool and that will get notification prior to an action level being reached so that sort of response actions can be taken, additional mitigation measures can be taken to make sure that dust concentrations are, are maintained at low levels. That's a feature that we have available to us, but as I mentioned, so far we haven't seen any dust concentrations uh, that are elevated. So that's not an action that we've taken yet, but it is available. The dust monitoring plan that describes the details of this monitoring and the action levels has been shared with GZA, the independent environmental reviewer, and is also available on our project website should anybody want to take a look at it. And of course, if you have questions about it, we're available to answer questions and GZA is also available to answer questions. The dust monitoring data reports are also posted to our website and shared with GZA for anyone who would like to look at those data directly. There are data tables and there are also charts that, that show the concentrations at the different locations. I'll turn it over now to Mike from TRC, who will talk about regulated waste abatement. Thanks, Juliana. Good evening. I'm Michael McCaffrey, Vice President of the Building Science and Industrial Hygiene Group for TRC Environmental Corp. Our involvements included the initial site survey and regulated waste inspection um, that's been performed by TRC to identify types of existing waste uh, locations and quantity of the material, design specifications for removal of each type of regulated waste have also been provided to the project team for work plan implementation. Project team has submitted an initial abatement plan, non-traditional work plan, mass DP, and has received approval to commence abatement work. In addition, the city also received notification of the start of the abatement, asbestos abatement work. Um, additional uh, amendments to the asbestos abatement plan have been submitted, mass DEP for review and approval. These amendments add additional work areas to the approved asbestos uh, abatement plan. Since abatement activities have commenced on the project, TRC has had two mass licensed project monitors on site daily providing oversight and meeting with meeting and reporting back to mass DEP. Asbestos monitorings, um, North Star has, is collecting air samples for asbestos analysis from within abatement containment areas to ensure worker safety. In addition, TRC is collecting air samples for asbestos analysis from outside the abatement containment areas to ensure that the containment is effective. These sample results are submitted to Mass DEP daily. After an asbestos abatement is complete, each, contain, in, in each containment area, TRC is collecting air samples for asbestos analysis to confirm abatement is complete, final air clearance sampling. If results of clearance sampling indicate asbestos fibers are still present in the containment area, additional abatement activities will occur and additional clearance sampling will be conducted. To date, air samples collected on this project have not exceeded the final clearance criterion of 0.01 fibers per cubic centimeter. The asbestos abatement plan describing the details of the abatement and monitoring activities has, has been shared with GZA and posted to the project website. Thank you, Brooke from Suffolk. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we look at this project as a great opportunity to build some long-term careers in construction for South Boston residents. And uh, the ownership team has worked very closely with Suffolk to make sure that we follow through on those commitments. Um, some of the outside organizations that we've been working with to help us achieve this goal are Building Pathways, which is a pre-apprenticeship program based in Boston. Youth Build Boston, which is also another pre-apprenticeship program. We are signatory with the Carpenters Union, uh, who have been a great partner of ours in trying to recruit locally uh, into the building trades, as well as the Metro 
Building Trades Council, which is the umbrella organization for all the unions in Boston, with the exception of the carpenters. Also, we have a strong commitment to see that veterans have an opportunity to work on this project. And we have been partnering with Helmets to Hard Hats to achieve that. We've done extensive community outreach. Um, some of the uh, institutions within South Boston and the city that we have worked with so far include Excel High School, Madison Park uh, Technical Vocational High School, which is the only vocational high school in Boston, the Boston Public School System as a whole, the Boston Resident Jobs Policy, which um, is the office in charge of ensuring that we are hiring locally, and as well as the Office of Workforce Development with the city. We've also had great success working with the South Boston Liaison for the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. Uh, our project team and partners hosted a virtual job fair in November of 21. We had 35 registrations and 10 in attendance, and we explained the pre-apprenticeship to apprenticeship uh, pipeline and how that works and how people can get opportunities uh, to work on this project. Uh, in partnership with the Excel School, as I said earlier, we had a virtual career fair for students in January. We had 30 students attend and um, one Excel High School alumni has applied to Building Pathways already, so making some good progress there. Next slide, please. So uh, coming up, we'll be doing more with Building Pathways. Um, they, um, again, are working on developing a pipeline of workers in South Boston and providing access to free online training. Applications are posted on the project website, and the latest deadline to register is April 15th. Uh, there will be, the city is running an in-person construction opportunity fair, which we'll be participating in on Thursday, April 7th at the uh, Work2 Center in Boston. Um, if you see on the right, You'll see this on the, the, the construction fencing, the scrim. This is a QR code where if you're interested in finding work on this project or about apprenticeship opportunities, you, you can scan that and uh, we will track your progress and make sure that someone reaches out to you from the project team. We're also uh, planning project site visits with some of the groups I just discussed, including Excel High School, Youth Build and Building Pathways. Uh, we'll be looking to do that in May to June so they can get a firsthand experience of the building trades uh, on this particular project. As well, we want to provide free OSHA training for South Boston residents in the late spring. The date and registration will be posted on the deconstruction website. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Anastasi, um, to go over how we've been doing so far to date on the project. Anna? Thank you, Brooke, and um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Anastasi Dufo. I am with the Trade Partner Diversity Team at Suffolk, and I am the Compliance Manager on the project. As such, I focus on monitoring and compliance, ensuring that we have a diverse workforce on site and that we meet our commitments to the city, making sure that local residents, people of color, and women are employed on this project, and in some cases, helping with the training of those workers. Um, the project is offering employment opportunities to Boston residents, starting with the first demolition permit and will continue doing active construction. As you saw earlier, we have multiple ways to engage with local residents, including work on job applications, and we help the applicants with local resources so they can get placed. On another front, the project team is working with local veteran groups, such as Helmet to Hard Hats and Mass Fallen Heroes, to promote construction trade jobs. We also set a target to have at least 20% of the apprentices on this project being graduates from building pathways and similar programs. Looking at the workforce, to date, we have a count of 68 workers on site with 11 of them being Boston residents, two are from South Boston, 43 um, people of color, two female, one veteran and one ap apprentice. Again, we are ded dedicated to have a diverse workforce throughout the entire project. Outside of the trade workers, the makeup of the team working on this project is also diverse. We currently have a staff of 18 personnel comprised of four Boston residents, one local South Boston resident, four veterans, six people of color, and five females. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mega to talk about community communication. Thanks, Anastasi. Hi, everyone. I'm from HRP, and I just want to remind everyone how they can get in touch with us during deconstruction. 
um, throughout the deconstruction process. Uh, so first, uh, the Community Independent Environmental Reviewer, GZA, uh, Marianne and Rebecca, who you heard from earlier today, can both be reached directly at lstreet at gza.com. Uh, tonight is our third community meeting, but we will continue to have periodic uh, community meetings to provide updates as we go through deconstruction. Um, and again, you can find all of this information tonight, including a recorded uh, the recorded Zoom at our deconstruction website, uh, suffolk-lstreetstationboston.com. Um, and you can also register on our website to receive periodic updates directly to your email. Uh, we'll continue to host our uh, direct phone hotline for urgent, uh, urgent concerns and questions. Um, and that hotline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so again, the website will provide all of this information for how you can stay in touch with us. Um, and uh, also the, the presentation you are watching today. Next slide, please. Uh, and just a just a reminder, we continue to partner with uh, the community, um, including recent donations to the South Boston Neighborhood House, Heading Home, um, and the Women's Lunch Place. And now I'll turn it over to Melissa. Thanks, Mega, and thanks everyone for your attention during our presentation. Um, in addition to deconstruction, our team has been busy working on planning and designing the first phase of the new development at 776 Summer. In the coming weeks, we'll be filing uh, an application with the VPDA for design review of the components of phase one. And so we wanted to provide that update and also a preview of what will be in the phase one. You can see the plan here with the first phase outlined in black and later phases sort of grayed out. We're excited to say that the initial phase includes the construction of the two and a half acre waterfront open space, which will be a fantastic neighborhood amenity and add to the network of public open spaces in the City Point neighborhood. Phase one also includes the adaptive reuse of the three magnificent Edison turbine halls. Those are the green and white uh, tiled turbine halls that everyone knows. Uh, those will house retail and civic and cultural space on their ground floors, providing new services and amenities for the community. And lastly, two new commercial buildings will be constructed at blocks D and F that are shown here in blue. Uh, and we will also be uh, performing the offsite transportation improvements to Summer Street. In this way, much of the public benefit associated with the overall de redevelopment project gets delivered at the front end of the project something that we're very proud of. Once the filing is made, there will be a public meeting in coordination with the BPDA where more details on the phase one will be provi provided and the public can ask questions and provide feedback. In terms of schedule, next slide, please. This slide shows the anticipated timeline for deconstruction and permitting and construction of phase one. Our goal is to start construction of the first phase as deconstruction is winding down in order to minimize the overall duration of construction activities on the site and deliver phase one as soon as possible. Advancing the design review to an approval this summer will be an important milestone and allow us to complete design documentation, bid and procure the work and break ground on phase one by around the middle of 2023. We anticipate it's an approximately two year construction schedule, so we'll be able to open phase one to the public around mid 2025. This schedule also shows the community benefits that we committed to in the PDA master plan that are tied to these early phase one milestones. For example, as you just heard, the start of the deconstruction phase initiated our construction workforce development activities, such as the annual job fair, and working with groups like Building Pathways to enter people into their pre-apprenticeship program and get their graduates working on the site over the course of construction. There are other significant community benefits that will be coming online as we progress through project milestones. These include four annual internships, two to South Boston residents that will start once we receive BPDA approval on that first phase PDA development plan. So we expect that those internships will start later this year. There is also a $1 million scholarship endowment to the South Boston Sports Hall of Fame, who will administer the endowment and award college level scholarships to South Boston residents every year in perpetuity. 
we will be making that contribution when we pull the building permit for the first new building on the site. So approximately the middle of next year. And then there are a number of benefits that start when the first phase opens, which include a $1.75 million contribution to the Medal of Honor Park and Christopher Lee Playground when we get our first certificate of occupancy on the first new building on the site. Additionally, the phase one will deliver a portion of the parking spaces that we committed to be available to South Boston residents free of charge on nights, weekends, and during snow emergencies, as well as incentives for small retail businesses that may want to locate here. And we'll begin making annual payments to the MBTA, which will continue for 15 years for a total of over $10 million. The MBTA is to use those funds to make improvements to transit service in the City Point neighborhood. We're very excited to move forward with phase one and the transformation of the former power plant into a vibrant and new district, which the community can enjoy and of which all we can all be proud. This concludes our presentation and we can now open it up for questions. April. Thank you, Melissa. Um, traditionally, this is where we recognize the elected officials who have all been invited to join us. And I do see we have a representative of Councillor Flynn's office, Councillor Flaherty's office, and Representative Peel's office. So I would like to acknowledge their participation and thank them for being here. Um, I don't see any of the elected officials themselves. Let me just take one more moment to scan through, make sure we're not missing anybody. Um, so I think what we can do now is just launch right into our questions. So our first question of the evening is about the smokestacks um, and the timing of when they will be dismantled and the process that will be used to dismantle them. And I think this is a David Pearson question. Thank you, April. Um, so the end of April, we will commence the scaffolding um, erection around and, and create an entire shroud and containment around the stack. And then we will put in bracket scaffold and work in a top-down manner and piece by piece, take those bricks away and put them within the chute of the uh, stack itself. And from there at the bottom, we'll use heavy equipment to haul them away. Thank you. Um, Thank we have you. questions about rodent control. So I would ask Chris, if you could please review for us um, the rodent control plan, including the frequency, extent, and effectiveness of that program. Sure, I have a, a couple things to add on the rodent control program. Um, so we've maximized the, the rodent control program to the greatest extent possible on this job. Uh, I'll give you a little, a couple updates on that. Uh, our licensed exterminator has performed uh, work on other large projects, and we, we talked specifically with him on this job in neighborhoods that are densely populated. And he brought these recommendations and best practices to this project. Uh, so that informed his design and layout of bait traps and capture traps uh, on this site. Uh, to add to this program, we've also added on top of it, uh, our daily walkthroughs around the perimeter and within the uh, buildings of the job site by our project staff. And uh, in these, we'll highlight anything that might be uh, a red flag or something we see. Um, and we've also brought him in, uh, this being our uh, licensed exterminator, to weekly assessments and inspections uh, on the site. So we're, we're taking our cues from him on examples of other projects, and we've actually tightened up a lot of what we're doing here with our timeframes to make sure that we're addressing any potential issues. Uh, one last piece of this is that the program we have right now is a, it's a living process, and it's going to change with the deconstruction of the buildings and we're taking that into account and we will reevaluate and reassist things as they move forward with our, our licensed uh, exterminator. So it's a living program that's going to change as the building gets uh, removed. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a question about GZA's experience working in Canton um, and whether or not that was at the Plymouth rubber site. So I wonder if GZA can just give us an overview of um, the example that was on your slide of working in Canton. Sure, happy to see you. Hear me okay? I got comments that I was kind of garbled. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little mumbled. 
asking me, no, I also I can't really address it right this second, but I will do my best and I will try to enunciate. Um, yes, it was at the former Plymouth Rubber site. Uh, the work I was involved with specifically was working for the town of Canton in not exactly the same role, but a similar role, right? In describing things to the, to the community and providing um, another perspective um, on that particular site. So not exactly the same thing here, but um, working for the community as opposed to actually performing the ground down work uh, ourselves. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, we have a question about um, any potential contaminants on the site. We've heard a lot about asbestos, and there's a question about what else may exist um, there. And I, I'm hoping that David Pearson can answer the question for, for above ground and maybe Juliana for anything below. Yes, so there was an extensive survey performed, and it identifies uh, some items, lead paints, pumps, motors, oils, gauges, bulbs, ballast, signs, the elevators, stains, and some debris. But all of this has been quantified and identified. And we have the trained labor on site that is actively going around and collecting those items, packaging those properly, and then they will be shipped off to uh, or in accordance to the um, governing regulations. Thank you. Juliana, would you like to speak to anything below ground? Sure. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, there are uh, impacts in the soil at the property associated with the former use for electrical generation for so long. These chemicals are um, primarily related to constituents that were used as fuels in the former power plant. So those that would have been coal originally. So chemicals associated with coal, could be uh, certain types of metals, arsenic, lead, mercury, those types of chemicals. Um, and also then later, uh, liquid petroleum fuels were used at the site. And so there are areas where we've identified uh, petroleum impacts in the soil. The way that, that those impacts will be managed, some of that, that remediation of those contaminants will, is not physically possible right now, just at, while the buildings are still in place, as the buildings come down, we'll have physical access to address uh, those areas where there's contamination above uh, acceptable levels. Um, during the work that's ongoing now, we have a report that's referred to as a release abatement measure plan or a RAM plan under the MCP that was submitted to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. It was prepared by Sanborn Head, our licensed site professional, submitted to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection prior to the start of our work that documents where the, these different chemicals are present in soil and how soil needs to be managed in accordance uh, with the MCP. That document is, is available on our website. It's also available on MassDEP's website if anybody's interested in taking a look at it. Thank you. Um, we have a question about the, the visual that had a marked area called cold storage area. I'm hoping Melissa can speak to that. Yeah, I, I think that was on one of the uh, deconstruction sequencing slides. Um, so the cold storage was just a description of that area of the 1898 building that was originally used for, for cold storage on the far east side of the 1898 building. It's called the coal pocket or, or coal storage area. It will be a uh, part of the decon deconstruction. So it's not a, it's not a new use that's that's coming on the site or it's not a use that we're, that's where, that we're retaining. It's a historic use. Thank you. Um, question for David Pearson. How tall is the Lampson crane um, in order to reach the, the top of the stacks? Um, you could help us understand. So the crane that we're going to bring in is uh, an LR 1300, and that will have 164 feet of main boom and 184 feet of luffing jib, and that uh, will reach the top of the stacks. Thank you. Um, there's a question here about bicycle safety during deconstruction. 
Chris, do you mind just reviewing the plans and explaining the, the or, yeah, so and bike safety. No problem on that. So part of the the uh, traffic safety that we're going to implement is um, one of the reasons we're putting up uh, the scaffold and the scrim is to truly delineate anything that's happening between traffic, bicyclists, uh, pedestrians, and what's happening within the job site. We're we're taking it one step further to ensure safety and uh, belts and suspenders approach there. So uh, on um, Summer Street, the uh, actually the the there's a bike lane there that only is a partial piece of it. We're going to have to uh, put the scaffolding on that piece, and then it's going to be restored at, uh, after 12 months on the project. Uh, so there's going to be a, port, a time when the, the parking is taken, and it's going to be uh, given back as soon as possible. But the protections there are going to be mainly done by uh, Jersey Barriers fencing and the scrim and the scaffolding that we're going to put in place to keep everything away from any uh, pedestrians, anybody who's nearby. And April, I might just add, um, since people are asking questions about uh, uh, cycling safety and facilities, that the future project, when we start to build the phase one, will be delivering improvements along Summer Street, uh, as I mentioned in, uh, a little bit earlier, and that includes new bike facilities along Summer Street um, that will make that whole stretch a lot safer uh, for cyclists. Thank you, Melissa. Um, we have a question about the bus stop and the, the decision not to move the bus stop. And I'm hoping that Chris can talk about, about that, <clears throat> maintaining the bus stop in its current location. Yeah, I, think, I assume that that's referring to the number seven bus stop, that uh, yes. the, the way that we are uh, formulating our, our work site and, and our work, um, we, we want to work around it. We don't want to disrupt any of those existing routes. Uh, and we can do that in a safe manner. We've been able to design and um, make sure that there's safety around that, that location. If, if you look at that corner of the project, there's a brick wall that runs uh, down the southwest corner of the, the job site. It's like a courtyard that we call it. That will stay up and protecting anybody walking by through to the end of the project. It's one of the last thing the things that come out of the project. So. In turn, we're keeping uh, a protective wall between that bus stop and any work we're doing, as well as uh, some annual space that, of that courtyard so nothing's happening nearby. So we found a way to work around that. We thought it best not to impede on uh, something that works and we, we want to mitigate uh, as much as we can through the deconstruction and not moving bus stops. Um, the vibration monitors have been up for a little bit. Do we have any early results to share? I think this might be a Chris, Chris question as well. Uh, yes, the, the vibration monitoring, dust monitoring, all of those mitigative measures that I mentioned on the four slides, those have been up and running uh, since the start of the project on December 1st in 2021. So yes, um, day one, we have them up and running. And I assume there's been nothing spectacular to report as far as vibration monitor. Has it, has it been, the results been what we expected, that there hasn't been any vibration? Um, speaking from memory, I don't believe that we've hit thresholds. Um, so no, uh, and if we do, we get alerted uh, immediately so that we can look at the operations. But uh, so it's really a real time, the vibration monitoring is really a real time operation so that if you even get close to the threshold, we're told uh, and so that we can stop our operation and uh, figure out a better way to do it. And I would just add, it's it's normal that the that there hasn't been any alerts yet because we're primarily doing abat abatement work, right? So there's not a lot of, of deconstruction happening quite yet. So we have a question about um, the, how the dust action levels were developed, and I'm hoping Juliana can help us understand that. Sure. Thanks, April. So that the dust action levels were calculated based on the concentrations that we know, the concentrations of different chemicals that we know to be present at site, at, at the site. And, and we know those to be present based on, on the sampling work that we've conducted that I talked about through the soil and groundwater um, and that David talked about. 
and the building materials. Um, and th the process of, of calculating these action levels is described in that dust monitoring plan on our website, but I'll, I'll talk through it conceptually here. Essentially what we did or what Sanborn Head did is they looked at the maximum concentrations uh, of the chemicals that were detected. And so this would include chemicals associated with the historic uses that I mentioned. So the metals that uh, might be residually present in soil associated with both former coal storage and potentially also coal ash, which would, have, would be the, the results of the coal after it's burned. Also chemicals associated with petroleum fuels that would have been used at the site um, and other chemicals that may just simply be present um, in urban fill that would have been used at the site to, to fill the land prior to its original development. So the maximum concentrations of these chemicals were um, were considered in, uh, in a human health risk assessment, evaluating exposure to dust, and the dust was assumed to essentially be generated uh, from soil containing those maximum concentrations that have been presented at this, at, that have been detected at the site. And that's how the dust action level was set. Um, so I'm happy to answer any more specific questions that, that individuals may have about it, but it, it's a, it's a, a one concentration of dust that considers all of the different chemical concentrations. And then we set one threshold that is protective of all of those different chemicals. Thank you. Um, we have a question about work hours. I'm hoping that Chris can review what the work hours hour are and maybe the hotline for what community members, a resource for community members if there is some noise that they wish to investigate. Of course, uh, work hours for the project are 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's during the the uh, the week. Uh, we do have a, a the openings to do weekend work where required. Uh, those need to be permitted by ISD. And additionally, when we get into uh, some deeper abatement within the buildings, we are able to do a quiet work. Uh, second shift, which would be around 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., which is interior to the buildings and is, uh, we consider it quiet work because it's no demolition, not making noise. It's really preparatory for being able to load out in the morning and create safety and set up a morning shift that'll come in in the morning. So th those are the main work hours. Uh, I think there's a note here, uh, Do are we there at 3 a.m.? No, we're not there at 3 a.m. Those are the work hours we're working around. Thank you. Um, there's a question about how many people are on the Zoom. The high number that I noted was 61, but we will include this in the FAQ um, when we publish it and review um, the, the number of participants. Um, we have a couple more questions about the staff, just the timing of the staff coming down and um, the safety of bringing that down. So maybe David can just review that one more time. Yes, thank you. Um, the timing is within 30 days, we should start to see the scaffold set up. And uh, from the safety standpoint, again, workers, uh, this will be done manually. So it'll be done with a, an entire scaffold system erected circularly around the, the stack from roof deck to the top of that. And then workers using platform uh, brackets will work the stack and manually chip the bricks inward. Um, at all times, the material is wetted and it flows inward. It never comes outward. So, and we have a second for belts and sus suspenders protection with the scaffold and the shrouding. Hoping I answered that question more complete this time. Thank you very much. We have a question about uh, mass support and truck traffic and how we're coordinating with the, the operations at Massport. I wonder if that's a question for Chris. Yes, I, I can answer this. So uh, the, the quick answer, and I'll get in a little more detail, is yes, we've been coordinating with Massport. Uh, we really want to take the, the good neighbor approach to this project, both with Massport, Boston Transportation Department, and you, the neighbors. It's very important to us. 
Uh, with regard to Massport, um, we've looked closely at the dedicated freight corridor and impacts that we may have on it and that it on us. Uh, and the benefit there is that there's a dedicated light that is on call for them so that they can actually always get their trucks onto Summer Street. Additionally, when they're coming south, there is a dedicated left turn lane, which won't, they can turn left into the DFC and not slow down traffic on Summer Street. So that's part of it. We've also worked with uh, BTD throughout this process to make certain that uh, we're working through work hours, approaches, and all processes. Uh, we, we've been very, tried to be very transparent with our communication with both BTD and Massport. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions about, but that really, I think, relate to the next phase of development. Um, so I'm going to turn these over to Melissa. I think one is about parking and what our plans are for parking. I don't know if we want to get into the specifics of that now or talk about maybe our process for how we're bringing forward the development plans. Sure. So I think the, the first one is on the availability of parking in the future development uh, for availability of parking for the current South Boston residents on the site in the, in the future development. So first of all, just to put it in context, the master plan was permitted with approximately a little over, but approximately 1200 parking spaces on the site to serve all of the uses. Um, there's a mix of commercial and residential uses on our site. And so it's anticipated that there is some, what we call shared parking, right? Commercial uses, people go to work in the day, they go home at night. And so there's some overlap there in terms of when the parking is needed for which kind of use. In a similar fashion, we anticipate that some of the commercial parking that would be available for our tenants on the site during the day will not be needed by them in the evenings or on the weekends. Um, and that's why we're able to offer uh, the parking spaces to the South Boston residents. The commitment was for 120 parking spaces out of the approximately 1,214. So it's roughly 10%, a little under of the, of the total that was permitted. We don't have our uh, final count yet, but we expect we'll be delivering approximately half of those number of spaces in the first phase. So with the first phase, we would be able to offer approximately half of the of the 100 and 120 to South Boston residents, again, to be available free of charge, nights, weekends, and during snow emergencies to help alleviate uh, some of the, uh, I guess, stress in, in, the, in the system of the, on the South Boston uh, streets, for lack of a better term. Thank you. Um, we have a question about the waterfront park and rebuilding the seawall and um, how that is being tackled. I don't know if you want to answer that question, Melissa. Yep. Um, so that, that's right. The seawall reconstruction will be part of the phase one. It's actually one of the first things that we'll tackle uh, because we need to uh, build the new seawall in order to elevate the land behind it, something that was talked a lot about during the master plan process. And this is part of our resiliency efforts on the site. We will be elevating the site. There's low, there are low-lying areas of the site and there are higher, higher lying areas of the site today. Naturally, actually, if you look back at historical maps, the higher areas of the site have always been elevated, um, and then some of the low-lying areas were, were filled in. So as part of the phase one, we will be creating, reconstructing that, that seawall, which is not in good condition today, elevating some of the low-lying areas be, behind it, and then building our buildings at an appropriate elevation as well um, in order to um, be resilient to the projections for future sea level rise. This will this barrier, if you will, will protect not only our land and, and the uses on the 776 Summer Street site, but will also protect the neighborhood behind us. And similarly, Melissa, we have a question about uh, the planned residential units and what kind of housing the neighborhood can expect and when they can expect that to be delivered. Yeah, so the housing will be varied. Um, it's not part of the first phase or really starting at the waterfront and, and moving back uh, towards the neighborhood in terms of the overall development strategy, delivering a lot of the public open space and um, the um, sort of heart and soul of the, of the 
what we what we consider to be the heart and soul of the development, the turbine halls in that phase one. Um, so the housing will be in a later phase, but it will be varied. It will be a combination of both rental and home ownership housing. And we expect that there will be a wide mix of unit types. Unit types mean like, is it a studio? Is it a one bed? Is it a two bed? Is it a three bed? So we expect there'll be a range of that. Um, also important for folks to remember is that we made the commitment to increase the amount of affordable housing on the site from the 13% that's required uh, under the inclusionary development policy or the IDP policy of the city of Boston. So we'll be delivering not only that required 13%, but also an additional 3% at slightly um, different AMI levels in order to create um, more uh, workforce, workforce housing. And um, that will take us to a total of 16%. And we'll be delivering that both on the rental side and on the home ownership side. Thank you. And one more question about the forward looking plans. Um, we have a request for a fishing area in the new waterfront park. Oh, I love that question. Um, so uh, I don't know if you can see it in the image behind me, but when we get into the phase one review, uh, we'll be able to share more images. But yes, we're preserving the piers that are out on the site today, uh, where, well, there used to be pump houses on them. The pump houses have already uh, been demolished by, by North Star, or deconstructed by North Star. Um, they're, the taking away the brick structures that were out there that were the pump houses is gonna allow us to open up those piers for human occupation now and get people down uh, close to the waterfront. And definitely one of the activities that we could see people enjoying out there is fishing. And one more question on parking. Will the parking for South Boston residents be on a first come first serve basis? I'm sorry, say the question again. Um, will the designated South Boston resident parking spots be available on a first come first serve basis? I think there's some operational issues that we have yet uh, to work through. We're a few years away, as I mentioned, from being able to deliver the parking. It'll probably be sometime in the 2025 uh, time frame. So I think we have. It's it's not intended that it would be designated necessarily for you know specific individuals. It's available on a first come first serve basis, and we will have to um, work out uh, how that's going to function operationally, and then communicate that to people as we get as we get more details. Thank you. Um, David Pearson, we have a question about the material in the brick and the mortar on site um, and the composition of that material, if you could speak to um, speak to that, please. So, I mean, for the most part, a, a chimney of that sort is going to be an, an acid resistant brick. Uh, but with respect to it's cleanliness and or if there's an asbestos content, those have been tested and, and tested negative for asbestos content. And the interior of the bricks are, are very, very clean. So the someone prior to my arrival at the site or North Star's arrival or even Hilco's did a very good job of cleaning that stack. Thank you. Um, Melissa, can you give us an update on the of discussions with Massport with respect to the residential deed restriction? Yeah, we're in very active conversations uh, with Massport on the um, modification of the residential deed restriction that they have on the property. And um, we are working through the details of that conversation um, as, as, as we speak. It's, it's a very active dialogue right now. You may have a question about the future uses on site and whether or not we can expect a grocery store to be located here. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, that is a very good question. Uh, we have not yet determined the retail tenancies for the future uh, development. We're still a little early. Um, for retailers who need to see a little bit more um, development in terms of plans before they can um, really know if they're interested in locating at a certain, a certain place or not. But that is certainly something um, that we can continue to talk about and, and think about. And if we, if we do get uh, a grocery store, um, we will definitely be able to, we will be informing the public of that. Thank you. 
Chris, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, one is on, can you just review the truck washing stations and how we're um, keeping the sidewalks clean and the soil on site? And then the second question is about, um, well, maybe we'll start with that one first. Sure. I can certainly answer that. So uh, we have one main gate on the project, which is gate B, which uh, has a wheel wash, which is made from uh, crushed stone and a, um, a, a tray essentially made out of uh, rubber that can catch all the, the water that we use on there. That's intended to keep uh, mud or water or other materials coming out of the, the site and going onto the roads. That's going to be in effect for the lifetime of the project. And if we need to move the gate in any case, we'll always have it uh, moved and we'll always have it in use. Um, that, so that's that's uh, how mainly the um, the water is, uh, excuse me, the mud is taken care of on the, the project. Is there a second question associated second with that? Second question is um, construction worker parking. Would you mind reviewing that? Sure, sure. Um, construction worker parking is uh, off of Summer Street. It's adjacent to uh, this site. Um, that is for workers, and we've asked the workers to either park there or to take public transportation, which I think is we think is a great idea. So we encourage them to. As for uh, our staff parking, if if you remember some of the slides, we had a trailer that was in the upper left-hand corner of the slides. That's at the southeast portion of the job. That's only for our our workers. Excuse me, our, our for our staff. And so we're only going to have staff up there in that location on the project, um, but no, no parking on site otherwise. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that is the end of our questions. Um, don't see anything more. Oh, we have one more question that just popped up that Chris, hopefully you can answer. Is the water from the truck wash going to the sewer system? No, it goes into a filter. We filter the water that comes out of it. Okay, thank you. So just to round out the evening, as we discussed earlier, this, this session has been recorded. This recording will be online for you to revisit or share with your friends. We will have all of the questions as they were asked verbatim, typed into Q&A document, posted online with written responses. And we thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.